This is Vincent Price. Mr. Alexander Parker Crittenden, a prominent San Francisco lawyer, came to Virginia City, Nevada for the first time in 1863. The town sitting atop the rich store of silver of the Comstock load was rambunctious and unruly. At the moment, Mr. Crittenden is seeking accommodations from a Mrs. Laura D. Fair, proprietress of Rutledge House, which she has recently acquired. She is not a typical rooming house landlady. Indeed, at 26 years of age, she is seductively attractive. A fact that does not escape the experienced eye of our Mr. Crittenden, who, at 46, is the father of some seven children, not to mention a couple of grandchildren, prima facie evidence that he has, uh, shall we say, been around a bit. Mrs. Fair is showing him a smallish bedroom, but as she moves about, his eyes are not on the room, but on her youthful figure. I'm sorry. The, the room is rather small, but it's the only one I have that's available at the moment. Oh, this will do very well. Very well. I, I wouldn't think of going elsewhere. The barber on the ground floor has bathing facilities. Very good, very good indeed. Um, Mr... It, it's Mrs. I'm Mrs. Fair. Oh. You run this place with your husband, then? No. You see, my husband is, is dead. Oh. I am sorry. I didn't mean to bring a... Please forgive me, my dear. It's quite all right. About how long will you be wanting the room? I'm not quite sure, but it may be an extended stay. And that's only the beginning of our story. Mutual Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week. Brought to you in Elliot Lewis's production of the Mutual Radio Theater. Our story, based on a true criminal case, Laura D. Fair, by Michael Raffetto. Our star, Tony Tennille. Mr. Crittenden told his landlady, the attractive young widow Mrs. Fair, that his stay at her rooming house in Virginia City might be prolonged depending on how complex the legal business which brought him from San Francisco might prove to be. He sent word to his wife in San Francisco that he was being detained by unforeseen problems in the case he was working on, but he hoped that he would rejoin her soon. Meanwhile, his southern charm had already managed to make him a welcome guest at Rutledge House. It is evening now, and he emerges from a bedroom adjoining the tiny parlor where his landlady is sitting reading a book. He closes the door quietly and comes to her side. Your little darling gave me a hug and a kiss. And I took her from my lap and put her into her bed, and she was asleep almost before I pulled the covers over her. Oh, what a sweet child she is. And so intelligent. It's hard to believe she's only four years old. Well, you've certainly won her heart. And she just loves the way you talk. <laughs> You'd think that all these years I've been out here in the West, I'd lose my Kentucky accent, but I can't seem to do it. I hope you don't. It's charming. Oh, those are kind words. And I thank you, ma'am. I was born in the South myself, but I left there so young nobody believes it. I knew we had a lot in common. What state? Mississippi. Oh, a blue-eyed beauty from Ole Miss. Won't you sit down? Thank you. My little girl Lilius's father, Colonel Fair, was also a lawyer... Oh, or did I tell you that? No, you didn't. Poor child. It's sad she never got to know her father. My mother and I don't mention him because his death was so tragic. Oh, I understand. Death is always tragic. Yes, but you see, in my husband's case, it was doubly so. He, he killed himself. Oh, my dear. 
How tragic indeed. Here, give me your hand. I dread the day when I shall have to tell Lilius the truth about her father. There, there, there. Come here. Sit on my lap. That's it. Now just relax now. Let me hold you the way I held your child a while ago. Put your head on my shoulder. Oh, that's my good girl. It's hard being a widow. But then it must also be hard being a widower, which, from what you've told me, you must be. Yes, yes. Just close your eyes and let your cares vanish while I kiss you gently, as I did your little girl a while ago. Months have passed and Alexander P. Crittenden's legal training is proving valuable in maintaining an amicable relationship with both his newfound mistress in Virginia City and his wife of some 25 years in San Francisco. At the moment, he finds himself in the unaccustomed role of a defendant as his wife confronts him with some hard questions. You mean to say you have to go back to Virginia City tomorrow? I'm afraid I do, my dear. But you just got home from there less than a week ago. Oh, it's quite true. But as I have told you repeatedly, the situation there has become much more demanding than I ever dreamed it would when I first took on this case. Are you planning to stay at the same place, the, uh... Rutledge House? Yes. I presume so. It has proved to be quite satisfactory. Uh, nothing pretentious, but, as I say, satisfactory. The same young woman still running it? Well, I... I presume so. I haven't heard to the contrary. A Mrs. Fair, I think you told me. I think you said she was a widow? Yes, she and her mother have the place. But didn't you also tell me there was a little girl? <laughs> my dear, you've lived with a lawyer husband so long, you've taken on all the attributes of my profession. Do you find my questions impertinent? Oh, not at all, not at all. Have I not proved to be a cooperative witness? Well, I... You, you sound doubtful. To be Why? honest with you, Alex, our friends are beginning to talk. About what? Well, for one thing, the way our social life has been restricted of late. Do you realize how many engagements, dinners, parties, receptions, heaven knows what else I've had to refuse because you've been out of town? Now, the social aspect of this isn't helpful to you because we move in an enviable segment of San Francisco society. And I don't think it's wise for you to jeopardize our position. But how am I jeopardizing it? I'm simply meeting the demands made on me by my profession. But that's my point. Are they simply the demands of your profession? Or are they other demands? It's the latter that's causing the gossip. Well, it's malicious gossip. And in the long run, that never hurt anybody. So why don't you stop worrying? I'll stop worrying, Alex, when I can be sure that it's only gossip and not the truth. Do you understand? Of course. Then it is only gossip? Come here to me and let me take you in my arms. Oh, Alex. You know that I love you, don't you? Yes. I guess that was all I wanted to hear. <laughs> Mr. Crittenden looked forward to his sojourns, and why shouldn't he? Almost a year has gone by since he first arrived there and became enamored with the sexually alluring young widow, Mrs. Laura B. Fair. Since neither of them was an amateur in the amatory field, it is not surprising that they became lovers soon after their first meeting, and with mutual decorations of love, it seemed that marriage of the worldly elderly man and the young lady of so arresting appeal was inevitable. But of course, there remained that formidable barrier, the fact that Crittenden still had a wife. How had he managed to keep that a secret, or has he? We shall see, for he has just arrived again in Virginia City. 
He engages a hack to speed him to Rutledge House. He hurries into the small reception room. His mistress sits behind the desk. He rushes to her side and tries to take her in his arms. She gives him a stern look and pushes him away. Please. What? My darling, what's wrong? A great deal is wrong, Mr. Crittenden. Well, I don't understand. You have deceived me. Did you hear me, sir? I said you have deceived me. Oh, come now. Let's talk this over in a rational way. Oh, no. I'll not be taken in again by your smooth tongue. Save that for the courtroom where you can charm a jury into believing what you know are lies. Well, you are being childish. I have never lied to a jury. There are subtle ways of lying, and you are a master of that. In what way have I ever been guilty of such an offense in so far as you are concerned? Very well. Why did you never tell me that you are a married man? And who told you that I am a married man? I'll not reveal the source of my information. Look me in the eye and deny that you have, at this very moment in all the months I've known you, deny that you have a wife. I have never, never said to you that I was not married. From the beginning of our relationship, you knew that I had children, not only children, but grandchildren. Is that not true? But you led me to assume that you were a widower. I would never have permitted you to love me if I had not believed that your wife was dead. I didn't question you out of respect for her memory. Do you regret that I found you so irresistibly attractive that I couldn't restrain myself from making love to you? That is no longer relevant. That's the way you lawyers would answer that. Don't turn away from me. Look at me with your beautiful blue eyes. That's it. And you know what your eyes are telling me? No, 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 no. Don't, don't look away till you hear what I was about to say. It is this. That deep within you, you know I love you. Have I not spoken the truth? Please. Let's not make this parting any more painful than it already is. Oh, this is not a parting, my darling. What else can it be? It is the beginning. You alone are going to be mine forever. That cannot be when you belong to somebody else. But I'm trying to tell you, that is about to end. The process of divorce has already begun. How can I be sure that you're not still deceiving me? Time will take care of your doubts. Meanwhile, I'm, I'm going to take you in my arms. Come. Let us be husband and wife. For in the sight of God, we are. long period, Mrs. Fair remained confident that Crittenden would live up to his promise to divorce his wife and thereby free him to carry out his promise to marry his young mistress. Accordingly, she left Virginia City and came to San Francisco to live and to be readily available to her lover. But the months of waiting flowed by and became years and she was still getting only promises from Crittenden that a divorce was in the offing. She grew desperate and began seeing other men, one of whom was a Mr. Snyder. Overwhelmed finally with disillusionment, she married the shadowy Snyder. Crittenden tried desperately to dissuade her from the marriage, and when she went through with it, he frantically set about to break it up. He bombarded her with letters of love, self-pity, promises of everlasting devotion. As Mrs. Snyder, she at last became the dominant one, and she treasured the supplicating letters that poured in. With visions of lying in Crittenden's arms, she would read his letters aloud to herself. I must see you tonight. Say yes and let me come. I cannot wait. This night is perfectly decisive of our fate. A.P.C. She takes another from the desk drawer, where they are tenderly stacked. It is now or never. If you won't see me tonight, we shall never meet on earth. Suffused with a warm glow of pride and passion, she takes up the next note. My darling, still, yes, still, my darling. It now wants but a few minutes to nine o'clock. At nine o'clock, I shall be near you. 
looking up to your window in the hope of seeing your dear face again. How I do love you. His frantic pleas eventually bring results. An assignation is arranged, and they are at last together again. He persuades her that she must divorce Snyder and make the arrangements to have him followed so that he is caught flagrante delicto with a woman of dubious chastity. A divorce from Snyder follows, and our former lovers are back where they were some six or seven years ago. But a fateful change is imminent. It is the winter of 1870 in San Francisco. Mrs. Fair is now 33 years old, but as the uncertainties of the past are being replaced by a more sanguine prospect ahead, her beauty remains undiminished. At a lodging house on Kearney Street, she rents a bedroom and a parlor. Subsequently, Mr. Crittenden rents an adjoining room. The landlady, Mrs. Letitia Marillia, said he told her he wanted the room in order that Mrs. Fair might know that he did not stay with his wife. At this moment, this is academic because his wife is in the East and has been for some time. But that situation is about to change and the reconciled lovers are soon to be confronted again with the imposing figure of Crittenden's wife standing between them. You mean your wife is arriving back in San Francisco next Thursday? Is uh, Thursday the 3rd? November 3rd, yes. Well, that's it then. That's when she arrives. But why? I don't understand. What do you mean, why? I mean, why is she coming back now after being in the East all this time? Well, she's bringing home a couple of our children, a young Parker who's been in military school, and our daughter next to the youngest one who's been staying with... I'm not interested in your children. I'm asking about your wife. Are you going back to her and and leave me? My dear, her coming back has nothing to do with you. Oh, yes, it has. It is very important to me. In what way? Oh, come now. I've done some acting in my time, and I recognize it when I see someone trying it. Well, I wasn't trying to act. I simply asked you a question. Tell me this. Have you missed your wife? Why, I... Look, there's no point to this cross-examination. You surely can't any longer have doubts about my feelings for you. Yes, but my concern right now is your feeling for her. When she steps off the train, will you welcome her with an embrace? Or formally, as one would to a wife he has sworn to divorce? I shall act like a gentleman, particularly so in front of my children. Would you have me do otherwise? The train from the east comes to Oakland. Will you go across the bay to meet it? We shall see. Why? Because I'd like to know. But why? Why? For reasons of my own. Now comes the fateful day of Thursday, November 3rd, 1870. That afternoon, Alexander P. Crittenden boards the ferry boat El Capita in San Francisco and goes across the bay to the Oakland Wharf to meet the train that is bringing his wife and children from the east. Unbeknownst to Mr. Crittenden, Mrs. Fair is aboard the same ferry. She watches him go ashore at the Oakland Pier. She sees him greet his wife and the two children as they get off the train. She watches them come aboard the ferry boat. They are smiling. The ferry pulls away from the Oakland Wharf as Crittenden takes his seat between his wife and daughter. He gives his wife a pat on the arm as she sits. She smiles. Before he can draw his hand, a woman, closely veiled, steps forward, stops in front of Crittenden, draws a pistol from beneath her long cloak, and shoots him down as she cries, You have ruined me and my child. She drops the pistol to the deck and disappears into the crowd. 
Three days later, Crittenden died. Mrs. Fair is indicted for murder in the first degree. This is Judge Samuel Dunell. I have presided in the trial of Laura D. Fair, which began March 27th, 1871. The doctors who attended Mr. Crittenden in his final hours before his death on November 6th, 1870, have already testified that the cause of death was in consequence of retarded circulation resulting from a gunshot wound. Prosecutor, Mr. Alexander Campbell, has just called his next witness, who has been sworn in and takes his seat on the stand. He is William H. Kensel. Would you tell us, Mr. Kensel, what your occupation was in the month of November of last year? Yes, sir. I was captain of Harbor Police. And you held that position on November the 3rd of last year, 1870, that is. Yes, sir. On that day, do you recall what took place aboard the ferry boat, El Capitan? I do. I went aboard the boat at a quarter past five o'clock. At the San Francisco Terminal? Yes, we went across the bay to the Oakland Wharf. Was there anybody among the passengers that you recognized? Mr. Crittenden was aboard. I recognized him. I did not know the defendant until the evening of that day. In other words, the boat made the trip to Oakland and got there without incident. Uh, yes, that's right. The shooting took place after the ferry boat had pulled away from the Oakland slip. Now, uh, just a moment, Mr. Kensel. I object, Your Honor. This witness hasn't been asked about a shooting. There's been no foundation laid for any such testimony. Your Honor, if the defense counsel will curb his tendency to cavil over inconsequential matters, I shall get on with the testimony. Your Honor, I object to having him... Oh, 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 all right, gentlemen. Now, let's get on with this witness's testimony. Frame your next question, if you will, Mr. Campbell, so that even Mr. Cook will be satisfied. Thank you, Your Honor. Now, Mr. Kensel, let's go back to the point where the El Capitan pulled away from the Oakland Wharf and headed back to San Francisco. You were aboard, weren't you? I was. Now, did anything unusual take place as the boat got underway? Yes, sir. Just after the boat left the slip, I heard a shot. When you heard the shot, what did you do? I ran to the starboard side where I heard the shot come from. I saw Mr. Crittenden stagger to his feet. His wife was endeavoring to support him. I went to her side and kept the crowd back. I, I do not know where Mrs. Fair was at that time. When I first saw her, she was about 15 feet from Mr. Crittenden and standing perfectly still. The boat captain, Captain Bushnell, handed me a pistol, and I was joined in by Mr. Crittenden's son, Parker. We went around the boat and into the cabin where Parker pointed Mrs. Fair out and said, that's the woman that murdered my father. Did she make any reply to this accusation? Yes, sir. She said, I don't deny it. I took hold of her and let her out to the after deck and kept the crowd away from her. When we got to San Francisco, I took her uh, in a carriage to the city prison. Did she offer any resistance? No, sir. All she said was she felt very bad and wanted a doctor. She said she had a doctor who lived on Kearney who'd been giving her drops for a complaint she had. Officer Barney Murray went off to see about getting a doctor because she seemed very excited. Said she was cold. How was she dressed? She had a waterproof cloak on, a brown color, and she wore a brown veil tied over her head. And I think there was a hood on her dress and over her head. Could you distinguish her features? Oh, yes. I told her to put the veil down, but she didn't try to hide her face. You stated earlier that the boat captain handed you a pistol shortly after the shooting took place. Yeah, that's right, uh, Captain Bushnell. Did he say anything to you as he handed you the pistol? He said it was picked up off the deck shortly after the shooting. Now, I show you this pistol, which has already been admitted in evidence. Do you recognize it? Yes, sir. It's the one the captain handed me. How would you describe it? It's what we call a small four-shooter. You examined it at the time? Oh, yes, sir. There was one empty charge. And three uncharged? Uh, yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Kensel. No further questions, Your Honor. We shall recess until 2 o'clock this afternoon. Mrs. Crittenden, the widow of A.P. Crittenden was called to the stand by Mr. Campbell, the prosecutor. She came forward, leaning on the arm of one of her sons. She was attired in deep mourning. After being sworn, she took her seat, raised her veil, and turned a steady look with her clear, dark eyes upon the lawyer for the prosecution, who uh, asked her to state her name. I am the widow of the late Alexander P. Crittenden, 
I was not quite 33 years his wife. I shall try to keep my questions at a minimum, Mrs. Crittenden, because all of us here are aware of the suffering that has been visited upon you by the tragic death of your husband. Thank you, Mr. Cameron. Mrs. Crittenden... You were aboard the steamer El Capitan on the afternoon of November 3rd of last year, is that correct? Yes. Would you please tell the court what took place on that day, from the time your train arrived in Oakland? My train arrived from the east, and my husband met me at the wharf. We went together on board the steam ferry boat, walked up the steps on the left-hand side, and then we crossed to see whether the seat we usually occupied was empty against the wheelhouse. We went around there and took our seats. My husband, my little daughter, my son, Parker. And were there other passengers standing about on the deck? Oh, yes. I naturally looked around to see who was there, having just arrived from the east. And uh, to my right, I saw a woman who, as far as I can remember, had a waterproof cloak on. Her face was covered with something. I observed it because I thought it was a strange dress for a bright, sunshiny afternoon... I turned away from her to converse with my husband. He had just made a gracious remark in his usual gentlemanly way to a woman passenger. And as we exchanged smiling glances, I put my arm through his. It was about five minutes after we'd come aboard. He, he patted my hand. <laughs> now you take your time, Mrs. Crittenden. Would you like a glass of water? No, thank you. No, I'm quite all right. <clears throat> As I said, he patted my hand, and there came a flash and a report almost in my face, it seemed. I looked up to see who'd fired the shot, and I saw this woman, the same figure that I'd observed before. My husband fell to the deck. I sat down beside him and I held his head. My son Parker came up and I said to him, Your father's been shot. And told him who'd done it. I stayed with my husband till the boat arrived here in San Francisco. And then I went with him in the wagon in which a bed had been set up. Uh, the wagon took us directly to our own house. And, uh, well, I guess that's about all that's necessary. Just a couple more questions, if you'll bear with me, Mrs. Crittenden. Certainly. My question is this. Have you ever heard the defendant say anything of the, of the nature of a threat toward your husband? Yes. When and where? Please give us the circumstances, time and place. Uh, well, the first time I heard her threaten my husband was when she came to our house around the 1st of November. Of last year? Uh, no, 1869. Mm -hmm. Please go on, Mrs. Crittenden. What time of day was it when she came to your house? Well, it was about 11 o'clock at night. My son Parker was in bed asleep. I was also in bed but awake. My husband had just come home when our doorbell rang, and Parker ran downstairs, opened the door. My husband went to the head of the stairs and shouted, Oh, what is it you want, or something to that effect. I could hear a woman's voice, but I couldn't hear what she said. I put on a robe and rushed into the hall, and I saw my husband go down the stairs and join the woman who was standing just inside the front door. Could you recognize her from where you were? Oh, yes. The hall light was on. It was Mrs. Fair. The defendant? Yes. Please continue. Could you hear what was being said between the defendant and your husband? Both seemed to be angry, and their voices were raised. Repeat what you heard. Um, she said... Mr. Crittenden, you have not been kind to me. This angered him, and he shouted, You women have unsexed yourselves. I utterly despise and abhor you. He used the plural, women. I don't know why. What else did you overhear? Well, she said something to the effect that my husband had ruined her life and that of her child. My husband threatened to have his son go to the police if she did not leave. She became almost tearful and asked him to walk her home. He refused, and I went back to my bedroom and I closed the door. Thank you, Mrs. Crittenden. That's all for now. Mr. Cook, do um, you wish to cross-examine? I have only a couple of questions, Your Honor. Uh, Mrs. Crittenden, you were aware, were you not, of the relationship between your husband and the defendant, Mrs. Fair? 
What relationship? Well, that's what I'm trying to find out. How would you define their relationship? As far as I'm concerned, there was no relationship. Oh, come now, Mrs. Crittenden. You surely don't contend that over a period of some seven years that the companionship that was so palpably apparent escaped your notice? I'm waiting for your answer, Mrs. Crittenden. I have no answer to something that never existed. Did your husband ever come to you and say that he wanted a divorce so he could be free to marry Mrs. Fair? I object, Your Honor. The conduct of the counsel is outrageous. And his treatment of this witness is a disgrace to the legal profession. I don't wish to engage in theatrics with my distinguished colleague, Your Honor. No further questions. This is Judge Dunell again. It is the fifth day of the trial of Laura D. Fair. Mr. Elisha Cook is about to open the case for the defense. Mr. Cook, you may proceed. If Your Honor, please. Gentlemen of the jury, we are all engaged and have been engaged for several days in a trial in which the defendant is charged with the murder of the man she loved. The man who had taken rooms next to hers and slept there the night before he was shot. The man who, through the years, wrote her fervid, nay, passionate love letters, which we shall put in evidence for the purpose of showing the exact relations between Crittenden and the defendant through a series of years. Now, it's axiomatic that to be guilty of murder in the first degree, it must be shown that the defendant's state of mind was such that the intent to kill was there. And it's equally true that a person of a deranged mind at the time of the killing cannot be held responsible because the mens rea, the guilty mind... The premeditated desire to kill is wanting. Such is the case here. We shall establish before you that Mrs. Fair, not only at the time of the shooting, but for 12 months before, at stated periods, was not a responsible being. She was in what was called a state of partial intellectual insanity and partial moral insanity. We shall show you that she was a very excitable and a very generous person. I will show you that her emotions were so strong that they outran her intellect, that it was as utterly impossible for her at the time Mr. Crittenden was shot to prevent it as it would be for a rabid dog not to bite you if you met him in the street. After she shot the man she loved, did she try to hide the weapon or throw it into the water of the bay just two feet distant from where she stood? No. She dropped the pistol to the deck of the ship three feet in front of her victim. Your Honor, at this point... I should like Mrs. Fair to take the stand for one purpose, to identify the letter she received from Mr. Crittenden. I asked the defendant to please come forward and be sworn in. Mrs. Fair rose to her feet, looked at her mother and her 11-year-old daughter, who sat just behind her, and after being sworn, took her seat on the witness stand. Mrs. Fair... I show you this package. Will you tell us what it contains? A portion of the contents are notes sent to me by Mr. Crittenden. Some while I was married to Mr. Snyder. How long did your correspondence exist? It commenced in 1866 when we were first separated and continued down to within a few days of his death. If the court please, I submit that the letters be turned over to the clerk to be marked. No, no. No, don't take them. I, I would remind the witness that it is only for the purpose of identification and is quite proper. My, my mother has another package of them. Your Honor, I submit that the letters be taken by the clerk and marked for identification. It is so ordered. Now, Mrs. Fair, I show you this letter. Would you please tell us when you received it? I received this last September before my divorce from Mr. Snyder. And the letter is in whose handwriting? Mr. Crittenden's. May I see the letter? I was about to hand it to you, Mr. Campbell. No, no, stop! Just be calm, Mrs. Fair. The prosecution is entitled to examine such evidence. Your Honor, I object to the admission of this letter and of all the correspondence counseled for the defense is attempting to introduce. This is an attempt to introduce a new principle in the courts of justice. We ought to assume that a married man may form an illicit connection with a woman and maintain it for years, and yet, whenever he shows an indication to return to the paths of morality, then that is a cause of insanity in a woman who has borne that illicit relationship and excuses his murder at her hand. Why, it lifts the mistress above the wife and asserts the monstrous doctrine. 
that the husband who has seen the error of his ways and intends to return to his wife may be shot in her presence by the mistress whom he has discarded. I submit, Your Honor, that the defense letter should not be admitted, for its only effect would be to heap old scandal on the dead and additional dishonor on the living. continued until April 26, 18 and 71, upon which day, after a short deliberation, the jury returned with a verdict of guilty of murder in the first degree. Four days later, I pronounced sentence on Laura D. Fair. My sentence was as follows. The judgment of the court is that on Friday, the 28th day of July next, you be hanged by the neck until you shall be dead. And God have mercy upon your soul. Mrs. Fair did not hang. She won an appeal and was granted a new trial, which began in September of 1872. She did not take the stand, and after 17 days was found not guilty. And so, at age 35, she walked forth from the courtroom a free woman. And what, you may ask, finally became of Laura D. Fair, that strangely alluring woman who loved so deeply that it became madness and who almost became the first woman to hang in the state of California? Well, one thing we can say for sure. She was durable. She lived to be 82. Radio Theater is brought to you five nights a week at this time. Tonight's original radio play, Laura D. Fair, was written by Michael Raffetto and produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. Your host was Vincent Price. Our star was Tony Tennille. Featured in the cast were Les Tremaine, Harold Gould, Mary Jane Croft, Tyler McVeigh, Stephen Markle, and James McCallion. The Mutual Radio Theater theme was composed by Nelson Riddle. John Harlan speaking. The Elliott Lewis production of Mutual Radio Theater is a presentation of CBI. <laughs>